Hi, I think I'm live. Um, <laughs> my, uh, my name is Karen Haycox, and I have the good fortune of being uh, the CEO for Habitat for Humanity in New York City. And I'm here to welcome you today to um, a special conversation with a special group of people. Um, so thank you for joining us uh, at our Habitat for Humanity house party, virtually here uh, live and on the computer. Um, I want to um, I want to welcome the cast from Come From Away, which, um, as we all know, Broadway is plays a tremendous role in the heart and soul of New York City. And this particular play uh, just does a tremendous job at telling a uniquely uh, New York City story through a really heartfelt and genuine lens. It's a personal story for all New Yorkers, but I think for me. Um, you may or may not know that I am a dual citizen, a citizen of the United States, but born and raised in Canada. And so this play in particular speaks to my heart uh, as a Canadian and American, as it ties my native land and my chosen home together through this uniquely told story. Um, so uh, we're going to have a conversation with three of the cast members uh, are joining us today, and we're so incredibly grateful. So uh, our goal with the Habitat House Party is to bring you some really interesting conversations with people that you might not otherwise get to meet and wrap that all around how people consider the role of home. Um, so, the, so home for me means Canada and New York City. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Petrina Bromley from Come From Away. Hello, pleasure to be here. Welcome, Petrina. Thank you for joining us. And I'm delighted uh, to be here, Karen. Thank you. Petrina's joining us from St. John's, Newfoundland, Canada. Thank you and welcome. And next up is Astrid Van Meeren. Astrid? Hi there. Thanks for having us. And I'm coming hey. to you from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Welcome. Thanks for joining us, Astrid. We're thrilled to have you here. And last but not least, welcome to Paul Witte. Hello, Karen. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for joining us. Um, I'm so excited to have this conversation with the three of you today. Um, we just, uh, for the rest of you who are joining us, we just, in the green room, we're talking about this. This is a really unique um, story for me um, as a New Yorker um, and as a Canadian. And But I want to honor and recognize, I think, that that this story come from a way which, which ties um, what happened in a small town in Newfoundland when the planes during on a 9-11 were rerouted and forced to land. And um, the story is quite honestly a rollicking good time and, and really manages, it's a roller coaster of emotions, um, but you leave the theater, I said to the cast earlier, you leave the theater feeling better than you did when you went in with and um and certainly wanting to be a better person but i want to acknowledge that obviously 9 11 um in this story it has its roots in a very somber day um certainly for new york city for the united states for canada and for the world and i want to acknowledge that every person um, has a special um, awareness and knowledge or memory of that day um so I want to start by asking the cast um, maybe where they were on 9-11. Uh, I think we all have a unique perspective. I am indeed fortunate that on, nine, on September 11th, 2001, I was on a Habitat for Humanity build site, um, which I often reflect and say, I can't think of a place that I would have rather been. I was with a number of good-hearted, like-minded people, and when we started to grasp um, the, 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 just the gravity and the, and the severity of what was going on, we were able to stop and reflect and pray to uh, an, ex an expression of whatever faith, um, you know, each of us shared. And, and it was a particularly, um, it was a terrible day. And yet in that moment, you know, to stand with people who were trying to build a home for another person, I, I'm so grateful. And it's such a, it's such a memory. Um, and I spent the first, now that I live in New York City, um, you know, I spent the first months of my uh, life here coming up uh, on, into the subway station at um, basically ground zero, and it was still under construction. 
And so I'm, it's just 9-11 as such looms large. Our offices in New York City are located in lower Manhattan. And so the shadow of the, the, the Twin Towers still loom large to this day, I think, for anyone. Um, so maybe we'll start with you, Petrina. Maybe you can tell us, um, if you wouldn't mind, sharing your personal memory of where you were uh, on September 11th, 2001. Sure thing. I actually was here in St. John's, Newfoundland at home. Uh, and our time difference here, we're about an hour and a half ahead of New York. Uh, so I was uh, up and about and uh, heard on the radio uh, that something was going on. And I remember my parents were actually visiting at the time and uh, from the other side of the country. And they, uh, uh, my dad was out berry picking, which is a very Newfoundland thing to do. He was out uh, picking blueberries. September is, is blueberry time. And uh, I came down and turned the TV on with my mom, and, and we watched a lot of it unfold on live TV. Uh, but the thing that I do remember most about it is uh, when my dad came home, and this again was, he didn't have a cell phone, we couldn't get in touch with him. Uh, but when he came home, he said they knew something was up because the amount of airplanes that kept flying over uh, made them realize something is not what it should be. And when they got in the car and turned the uh, radio on, they they heard what was happening. But uh, they were uh, taken aback by how many airplanes were suddenly flying over. Thank you for sharing that. Astrid? Um, I was on my first vacation from a tour of Mamma Mia. So I was uh, had just left Boston Airport, uh, <sighs> which has a strong connection to, to 9-11. And I was home in Toronto, and I remember being woken up uh, by a phone call. And I think a lot of people, uh, I don't think it was, it's not like staring at a traffic accident or anything, but so many people didn't want to be alone with it. Anybody who was alone seeing or hearing the news were reaching out to other people and, and trying to, I think there was a strange sense of community that day. And people just didn't want to be alone with this, this, this fear. And so uh, somebody had reached out to us uh, my, my uh, partner at the time. And um, we spent the rest of the day kind of, kind of in a daze, definitely just, you know, wandering around. But it is, it is such a, such a bruise for New York. It's still, it's such a tender, tender place. So we're, we're constantly aware of that, that strange thing of having, as you said, Karen, this beautiful story. And at the, at the heart of it is this, this wound for, for New York. And I think that uh, it does a beautiful job of kind of bringing healing to that as well you know but it, 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 we're always constantly reminded there's a line in the show about how people met each other and how they fell in love and the only reason they met because this horrible thing happened and I think the reason I have this this beautiful life had this beautiful life in New York and met all this incredible cast and got to tell this beautiful story is because this horrible thing happened and it's such a a human thing that that tragedy and, and love and goodness all kind of rub up against each other all the time well oh, thank you you're absolutely right and Paul uh, well, I was going into my senior year at North Carolina School of the Arts in Winston-Salem, actually. So um, I was still a rambunctious college lad when when it happened. So actually, I have a weird story that, you know, the night we had just gotten back to school and the night before I went out with a bunch of friends. So, you know, tied one on. And then the next morning, I was I was I woke up after everything had happened, basically. Um my roommate woke me up and I thought he was messing with me when he told me he's like he's like we've been attacked and New York's been attacked and all this stuff and I was like nah you're lying to me and I just like went back to sleep <laughs> and then he came in and sh shook me awake he's like you need to get in here so I like walked into and I, I'll never forget that moment when I walked into the living room and he was sitting on the couch and I didn't see the TV I saw his face first and um, and then I turned and looked at the TV, and the first thing I saw was one of the towers coming down. And uh, it felt like a, a very, it was like a Rip Van Winkle moment. Uh, like I had I, the world was like I I went to sleep and I woke up and and this is not the world that I went to sleep to. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so it was you know it was. Quite a, I mean, we just sat there and watched the TV all day, me and my roommate. And uh, and then later, you know, we had a, you know, we we're on a college campus with all of our old friends. So, you know, we had a, had some time together, which I think a lot of people did. 
Well, thank you for sharing that. I want to thank all of you for sharing that. And I just felt so moved to, see, you know, we have to acknowledge the roots of this story. Um, and, and, and I suppose, and yet we prevail. Mm -hmm. And, um, and in the roots of tra tragedy, as you so eloquently put it, at Astrid, comes these moments of incredible grace and strength and, and uh, resilience that, you know, it is true, I think, for all time that out of the roots of this tragedy comes some of the greatest humanity, you know, some co comes some of the greatest humanity. And this story for me is such an example of that. And and I shouldn't tell it. So can I can I throw it to one of you? Can you can some can someone sort of set the stage uh, for the for come from away? Because I I feel I feel such an um, a desire to do it justice that I feel like I should turn it to the professionals. Who wants to take that question? Katrina. Sure. Um, well, the the story starts unfolding. Uh, as the people of Gander uh, come out to uh, to tell everybody uh, kind of what they're going to see, it all starts on that very first morning with the local people going to work, getting their kids off to school. Everyone is just going about a regular day, and then the news comes, uh, and um, and the story unfolds as we see uh, different perspectives from people on planes, uh, pilots, people on the ground. Uh, the president speaks. Uh, there's just little snippets of everyone in time over the course of um, the amount of time it takes for all the 38 planes that collect in Gander to land. And then it unfolds over the five days that the people who find themselves in the literal middle of nowhere <laughs> in such an incredible event uh, as they start to uh, relax and, and uh, learn that they're going to be well taken care of. Uh, and friendships are made, and uh, um, there are bonds created, I think, that that have lasted uh, in real life to this day. Um, and we meet uh, a woman whose son is a firefighter in New York, a couple who um, are in the midst of maybe not the best point in their relationship, um, a, uh, the, a pilot, the first American Airlines' first female pilot, uh, Captain Beverly Bass, um, and, and a host of other people. There are so many people. There's only 12 of us in the show, but we uh, we actually carry off uh, somewhere in the in the range of 100 and some odd uh, characters that you actually see. We're representing 7,000 plus people, but uh, uh, you you certainly see 100 plus <laughs> individual moments of people in there. Uh, and the, the people of the town really rise to the occasion and uh, and do their best, even though it means bringing people into their own homes because there are not enough hotels, there are not enough halls and church spaces and gymnasiums to put all of these people in because it's a town of about 6,000 people, which gets doubled uh, in in moments when all the planes land. And it's a story of uh, of helping, of generosity, of kindness, of shelter in the storm and uh, and what really can be the best of humanity when we when we rise to the occasion. Thank you for and that. And it's it funny was... and there's good music. <laughs> it's funny and good music and, and you cannot, you know, I've been, I think I've been five times. I might be underselling oh, wow. that, might be more than that. Um, <laughs> and, but you, everyone is on their feet. Everyone leaves that audience with a smile. You, in spite of yourselves, you know, in spite of, you know, you, you see such a mix of humanity in the audience and in the seats, just wrapped up in it. And it is, it is truly contagious. Um, well, Karen, Karen, I've got you beat. I've, I've seen the show uh, <laughs> like 30, 40 times, maybe. I don't know. I, because I, you know, I wasn't part of the original cast, I, I joined the cast. I replaced Gino Carr, who originally played Oz. Blight's doing something weird. My curtain moved, is what happened. Now you have to somewhere. It's um, it's just a, it's a nice effect. Yeah, um, but uh, so I had to watch. You know, I, I learned. I watched the archival footage of the show for about a month before I started rehearsal, and then and then I just sat there for a month. You know, while I was rehearsing and just watched the show every night, and. Uh, I have never seen a Broadway show more than I've seen Come From Away. <laughs> I was going to say, that's no fair, Paul, because you'd be watching from, the, from yeah. the wings. But I didn't see that you were, I didn't mean, didn't understand that you had been watching from the seats. So oh, did yeah. you, 
there's, you know, just a little insiders, you know, we're all Can- the rest of us on this call are Canadians. So there's some distinctly Canadian content uh, and distinctly <laughs> Newfoundland content in the in the show that made people like me really smile at the memory. Um, least of all, it'd be the reference to the Tim Hortons. <laughs> <laughs> Tim yeah. Hortons, Shoppers Drug Mart. Yeah, all, the, all the little things, uh, the icons of home. Yeah, I know. It is the truth. It is the truth. The Tim Hortons scene makes me smile <laughs> to this day. <laughs> um, uh, and how did you, so so you told your story of how you came to be cast. Uh, what about you, Astrid? How did you come to the show, to the cast of Come From Away? Uh, well, I was, I was very lucky to have actually done a show with David and Irene, uh, their first show. Uh, this is only. This was only their second show, um, and came so quickly to Broadway. I had no idea that it was. It was considered quick, but yeah, it was a, a quick from from the beginning of their writing to it actually making it to Broadway. Um, I did their first show, My Mother's Lesbian Jewish Wiccan Wedding. So that kind of put my foot in the door. Yeah, it's a brilliant show. <laughs> oh my uh, God, that sounds great! I'm writing that down. <laughs> and also also based also based on on true events about uh, David's two moms. And um, so they, they're they really skilled at, at taking real events and, and distilling it down to like the, the best moments. I mean, they just, they're fantastic that way. And their first show was lovely as well. So that got my foot in the door. And then I, I sent a tape and got a call back and came to New York and stayed with some friends in Weehawken and it went okay. And I thought, well, whatever happens, I feel okay with what I did in the room. And then they offered it to someone else and that person turned it down. And uh, that's kind of, how things go and I'm so grateful to to have gotten that opportunity and to still be part of telling that beautiful story so that's kind of how I got I got there did it open in um did it open in Toronto or did it did it do its run up to Broadway in Toronto do I have that wrong well, it, it started in La Jolla, California, at the La Jolla okay. Playhouse, uh, its first professional production. But it actually started at the Canadian Musical Theater Projects at Sheridan College. I'm oh. Irene always, Irene, one of the creators, Irene Sankoff, always jokes that she thought, well, we're we're writing a show that they will be forced to do in high schools, you know, big <laughs> big cast and it's Canadian content and all that kind of stuff. So um, so it did start at a college, which I actually got to see that production and the, and the kids did a brilliant job of it. And I thought, oh, my gosh, to be a part of something this special, because even at the time, it's changed a lot from its its original um, presentation to now. But the heart of it has always stayed the same. The skeleton of it has kind of stayed the same. Maybe just the the, the meat and the meats and organs have moved around inside. That's a gross metaphor. But anyway, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> but the heart of it has stayed the same. We'll just say that the heart yeah. of it has stayed the same from the beginning. So it's something I've always wanted to be a part of. And I, I still kind of pinch myself that I'm, that I am. That, that is amazing. <laughs> I don't want to leave you out, Katrina. How did you come to be, uh, to join the cast? My story is long. <laughs> we got <But> time. <laughs> I'm going to mute um, myself. <laughs> so I was, uh, um, I was here home in Newfoundland working with a, a local company called uh, rising tide theater uh, during the 10th anniversary celebrations that happened in Gander. And we were out there to do a performance. Um, and I went into the one coffee shop that isn't a Tim Hortons. Uh, it had a vaguely Italian name. It's something different now. Uh, I think it's Jumping Bean now. But anyway, um, the only other people in there in that moment were uh, a young man and woman sitting at another table and the actor who was with me named Grant Tilly, who's from Toronto, uh, he, he looked over and had one of those kind of out of body moments of, I know those two people, <laughs> they're from Toronto. That's so strange. That's so, uh, that we is, went, is that a uniquely Canadian story? Cause I can't tell you the number of times <laughs> that has happened to me in small towns in Canada. And anyway, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. I think yeah. it's just one of those, uh, uh, uh like you're almost like uh, Paul was saying with a kind of um, um, the the who's the character that you cited? Oh my gosh, Rip Van Winkle. That yeah. kind of like when you see someone out of context like that, and you actually have a moment of sometimes you see someone out of context who looks like someone you know, and you go, "Is that so and so?" And then it isn't. It's just someone who looks like them. But then when you actually see someone you know, it does your mind just goes, "Whoa, what's happening? <laughs> Why are they here? This is so strange." Uh, but David and Irene were there to do their research. They were just starting the project and had come down to the 10th anniversary to do interviews with all of the people who were coming back for the anniversary, the locals, of course, and the uh, the people who had returned. 
uh, to be a part of the celebration. And so they were sitting down with their little, you know, uh, um, cards already putting things together to ask questions and who they were going to talk to. They were organizing themselves. And so we had a quick chat and they said they were writing a musical about the, uh, the 9-11 events in Gander. And I, like everyone else in Gander, went, what are you talking about? <laughs> Who's going to want to see a musical about Gander in 9-11? That's good luck. <laughs> I never, again, also never really thought anything would come of it, but thought that's really sweet. Good for them. They got a project. How nice. Uh, and, um, we kept in touch after the fact. Uh, we became Facebook friends, and uh, they saw me a couple of times in Toronto. I went up with a, a local company here called Artistic Fraud of Newfoundland, and we did a couple of shows in Toronto that they saw me in. So uh, I was uh, invited to audition in the long run and uh, was fortunate enough to uh, to land the role. Oh, that's great. It's a great story. And um, it gives us street cred, too, because we have a Newfoundlander. So exactly an right. and, and awesome, awesome person, that, and that awesome is performer. A, so. That is go. a very, uh, that is a, that for the, those of you who might be listening to Patrina's voice, that is the various Vegas hint of a Newfoundland uh, accent <laughs> that you're picking up. And if it gets any thicker, we won't be able to understand her. I just want to know. And, and, and there'll be, it, she'll be inverting verbs and, and objects and nouns and, and stay where you're at till you get where you're to. I'm not really sure. <laughs> stay where you're to till it comes where you're at. There you go. See, <laughs> is it too early in the interview for me to start talking about kissing the cod and what that means? <laughs> we haven't even had a drink, Karen. Oh, exactly. my goodness. <laughs> Well, you should buy us dinner or something. I should. <laughs> it is. I'm sorry for the inside jokes, but it's, I can't. It, it's a Cana distinctly Canadian story. Um, I encourage anybody who has not visited Newfoundland to give it to to give it a visit. It is the the Newfoundland people are the most delightful populations among the most delightful populations in the world. That is genuine. Um, that is before the 9/11 story. The nicest people in all the world they'll ever want to meet. Um, so that's a little plug for the province of Newfoundland. I'm we'll scheduled. take your praise. <laughs> there you go. On behalf of my entire uh, province, I will take your praise. <laughs> it is it is genuinely in, expressed. I've been fortunate to be there three times, and it is uh, I can't wait to go back. Um, I I wondered if um, you know I I think that I read that Beverly Bass, the pilot you mentioned, um, came to the show. I think a number of uh, and and some of the characters are compilations, right? And some of them are real life people. Do, you, do any of you have any story about some of the people that were on the planes that landed that came back to the show, like the pilot who Beverly Bass, who was the pilot on one of the American Airlines planes? Our doppelgangers come to see the show quite a bit, and we were lucky enough to have opening night in Toronto and opening night in New York. We got to bow with them, which was such a thrill for them, for them and for us. Well, more even more for us to to know that uh, they got to to feel that love that we get every night when we do the show. That that you talked about people being on their feet, that tsunami of love that comes at us. So for them to get, you know, a little a little taste of that was so delightful. I'm still friends with with Beulah. And Diane, who kind of make up uh, my main character. And uh, it was just Beulah's birthday not too long ago. I won't say how old she is in case she doesn't want that out there. But um, had a long chat with her. And, and um, yeah, these are people who have become, as Claude Elliott, the, the mayor, talks about, you know, what happened on 9-11 and days afterwards, that you start with strangers and then you become friends and then you become family. I think that that's happened for people we meet who are connected to this story who we represent but even we constantly have people who have come to the show who said well I was one of the plane people um we have people who you know they still have the American Airlines blanket that they that they had uh, that they stole uh, um from, from you know from their experience we have people who just say I didn't think I could get anybody to understand what I went through and how I felt so taken care of and how there's this kind of home that was created for me and going back to kind of like Habitat for Humanity like this this home that was created for them that they still feel so connected to and um yeah we meet a lot of them they're they're pretty they're pretty awesome people that's great thank you for re the reference to home Paul do you have any do you do you have a story like that do you get to connect to anybody well I mean since I uh straight you know I just started with the show uh in November of last year um, so I was sort of, I was the new guy, uh, on the block and, um, but I did get to meet, I met Bev, uh, and I met, uh, Hannah came to see the show, um, which was a very 
sweet, amazing experience. She's such a sweet lady. Um, and, uh, and I actually, um, so for, for the, for people who don't know, one of the characters that I play in the show is, um, uh, rabbi, um, uh, Orthodox Jewish rabbi. And he, um, he's not allowed to see the show, I think for, because of the dancing or some, some re there's some, there's some reason in the show religiously that he can't come to see the show. But, and he's not even, um, you know, I sort of play him, he's played as like a, an American, as a New York, as a New Yorker. Um, but I think in actuality, he lives in London. Um, and he was in New York and he wanted to meet me. And we had, we like just missed each other. Like, like they were trying to set it up and I was like, yeah, yeah, totally. I'll come meet him. Yeah. And then he got really busy and then he couldn't make it happen. But I was really hoping that we could, uh, we could meet. And then I've also had a little bit of contact with Oz's daughter briefly. Yeah. Um, but that's, but that was very brief. And that was like kind of right at the beginning, but yeah. Oz Fudge, one of the best names Oz, 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 of any character ever and a real name. I love yeah. Oz Fudge, was, yeah. If it was just if it was a character name, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be good enough because it's real, right? It's it's really yeah. that's amazing. What about uh, Petrina? Before I leave that, do you do you have any uh, interactions with the people that you? I have an interesting uh, sort of addendum to uh, uh, Paul's story that uh, the the rabbi that he's talking about uh, has a few moments in the show, but the big one is a, a conversation that he has with an elderly resident in Gander who was a man who had come over to Newfoundland as a very young child during the Second World War uh, uh, from Poland. And he um, he recounts to the rabbi that he uh, he was told to never tell anybody that he was Jewish, uh, to never admit it, because it would put him in danger. Uh, and it's a true story about a man in the community. Um, and his um, granddaughter <laughs> came to the show. Uh, and I'm, she's from Newfoundland. Uh, she's a lovely singer. Uh, and I, I met her uh, and just was had that strange moment of, wow, the, the, the truth of these stories and the reality of them. It really hits you when you meet people who are descendants of the people that we're talking about. I mean, it's incredible when you meet real, the real people, but enough time has passed that some of those people have, have passed on, of course. But the story is now being carried through generations and it's just, it's just sort of uh, incredibly beautiful. We have a, there's a character in the show, uh, Hannah, whose son is a firefighter, Kevin O'Rourke, who was there on the day and we've met his grandson and daughter oh. as well, which is just, just incredible to meet the real families of these people. Uh, it makes them even more real and the story like a little goose, flesh talking about it yeah, even, and because it just it's so palpably real all of it it's incredible yeah i don't want to ruin this to ruin that part of the story for anyone who hasn't seen it and and we know that when this whenever this point of reality that we're going through at the moment is over and broadway is back because we know broadway will be back um the show will be back that um that people should go and see it because um that is i mean uh, hannah's story is so uh, representative of so many of the firefighters who were lost on that day and and you kind of live that with her you know it is the most unique experience because you know the story you know the story you know how it's all going to turn out you're just seeing it and experiencing it for through such a variety of perspectives and um i love that it's such a um uh, i just lost the the word such a like a a, a broad that you all play so many characters and it is so seamless it's it's almost orchestral you know in a in a funny kind of way that um i just i just i adore it yeah our, our director I, christopher ashley did a beautiful job and 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 kelly divine our our our, our choreographer she she won an olivier and he won a tony so we, yeah they're they're they truly did a brilliant job in moving us around the stage and 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 it really creates that sense of community too, because you have to have each other's back, yeah. and that creates such a quick feeling of trust. And and um, it's, I have we have the best cast in in, in on Broadway. I, I'll you, fight anybody who says we don't. Uh, well, I I'm, think on one your, of the I'm little, on your side. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the little genius things that the show does is uh, the timestamps, uh, because we progress through the five days. Uh, and there's reporters and and local people who come out and say, you know, it's 10:45 Tuesday, 
September 11th. Uh, and they they put you immediately where you remember yourself being as soon as you hear those dates and those times. Uh, and that constant motion forward of what the next timestamp is, what the next day is, keeps people uh, engaged in a way that I think really services the the sort of forward constant feeling of the show because you're always being reminded, oh, I remember that day. Oh, I remember that day. I remember what I was doing, which I think is just a, a beautiful piece of the writing. Mm. I remember being so keenly aware because you know the time stamp. I, d I don't know that I know initially that it was five days, but you know, you know, as the days go by, you know you're coming to the end of the show. And I remember being, at first I thought, wow, this is kind of long. You know, you know, when you're sitting in the seat <laughs> and you think this is going to be, and it's going to be great, but it's going to be long. And then I remember as it got close to what I knew was going to be the end, I was, I was having that, sus that des true desire to suspend time. Yeah, I didn't want the show to end because I was so I was so wrapped up in in the moment and and in the show and in the story and in the music and in the and it's just a tremendous tre tremendous tremendous huge fangirl. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> but um, we talked a little bit about the role. Listen, let's talk a little bit about New York now and and um, kind of what what do you think um, uh, is next for Broadway? I mean. Um, uh, you know, Broadway, you know, it's Broadway is like home in New York for, um, you know, it's, and I'm, I'm, I'm looking at New York, you know, from my balcony here and it's, um, and I've, I've had occasion to be in Times Square and it is um, just the word surreal doesn't do it justice. It is, it is very surreal um, at the moment, but, but there is a pathway back. We know Broadway will come back. Um, what you know? What are your thoughts, or what are you hearing from the artists and the and the and the set people and the stage people and all of the people? This this particular pandemic is having a true disastrous effect on our New York City community and the arts in particular. I think. Well, we're we are very lucky as a. a uh oh, Astrid. As a cast. Oh, Therese, am I frozen? Oh, you're back. You're back. Am I back? Okay. I was gonna say we're very lucky as a as a as our cast, a come from away cast, that we are so close and loving with each other because we do have kind of um an ongoing thread, a text thread, we do have calls with each other. And so that touchstone has really helped me feel still that we're just on a very long intermission and we will be back. Um I think without that I would be feeling a little more adrift. So that sense of, of home again is, is really the people and the community that, that we've created for each other. And, you know, we, we kind of hold each other uh, up. And some days we have the energy to be the person who, you know, brings joy to the call. And some days you come and you just, you let, you let the, the, the hearts of other people lift you up. So it's been, yeah, I think, uh, who knows um, how long it will be, hopefully not too, too long. But I think some New Yorkers are actually enjoying having New York just two New Yorkers right now, like going to the galleries and, and the parks. And, but I, I can't believe I'm going to say this. I'm looking forward to a packed Times Square and an elbow in the ribs and uh, trying to get there before the train doors close and, and you know, wishing people wore more deodorant or whatever. I, I'm looking forward to that. I, I can't believe I'm saying that. Experiences. Yeah. And as a true New Yorker, part-time New Yorker, whatever, I will eventually be complaining about it three days later, but I look forward to those first couple of days. Exactly. The arts is really responding. Interestingly, you're hearing sort of um, kind of grassroots stories about artists coming together and, and actors coming together. And you're seeing a lot of virtual work. Are any of you working in the arts in in wherever, you, you know, whether you're in Newfoundland or Toronto or I think Paul said you're in Louisiana, right? There's got to be some music or something going on in Louisiana. They're irrepressible down there. Yeah, there's o well, there's always music in New Orleans. You can't yeah. you can't stop that. Um, yeah. But uh, I actually, you know, I've been trying. You know, when the pandemic started and we were all sort of locked in our houses at the beginning, you know, <clears throat> I started going out in my driveway and playing guitar and playing for the people in my neighborhood. Um, you know, and I still do that every night. I still go out there and play and just for a little while at least, you know. Um, but that's just, you know, that's more for me than anything else, you know, to sort of keep my, keep myself. Like I, it's funny when we, we just found out that the, um, 
Well, if I go back, first of all, I feel so grateful that I had a job when this whole thing started, which is a, you know, the, the sort of windows of time when you're not working as an actor that, that, that come in your, your career and, and just sort of like the timing of this and when it happened. And I just happened to be in this show when this whole thing started. And like also to join this brand new, uh, well-established family, you know, the, with, with this cast, you know, people who have been with each other for years and have a lot of history and a lot of, uh, connection with each other. And I was, I was just immediately enveloped into the, into the fold. And, uh, and that was like, that was pretty awesome. I mean, like it's, it's, it was amazing to me a couple weeks ago because we do this weekly zoom call that Joel, Joel Hatch, who plays, who plays the mayor in the show, you know, he, he sets, he sends everyone the invitation every week and as many people who can do it, they show up, you know, and, and I was sitting there listening to Jen Colella tell a story and I don't like, I don't know Jen really, you know, like I got to know Jen after the pandemic started because, you know, she left the show as I was coming in. She played, then, no, she played Beverly Bass. Is that right? Beverly, she, the original. Yeah. Yeah. She was the original Tony Beverly nominated. Bass. Yes. Yeah, she's a fantastic human being, fellow, fellow South Carolinian, um, and uh, and we, um, you know, we got to know each other through these Zoom meetings every Sunday, and have you know have become fast friends, and you know, and like the the fact that I'm even a part of this family feels like such a blessing to me. Um, um, I don't know how I wandered into talking about that. What were we talking about originally? <laughs> we were talking about, that's good. We were talking about, you said you went outside and played music. And, right. uh, and you know, which I is, I think art is irrepressible. And I, I'm just curious how it's having, coming out for all of you. Yeah, having a connection to something. And so, you know, we just found out that, you know, the shows, shows aren't coming back at least until the middle of next year, right now, you know. And, uh you know, that day when we found that out, and we've had a couple of those, you know, oh, it's going to be this long, oh, it's going to be this long, and now it's going to be this long, and, you know, it knocked me back a little bit, uh, honestly, and uh, and I had a good, good cry, you know, and I thought, because, and, you know, it made me feel good, because I thought, I really love being on stage, I, and I, um, you, you take it for granted, when you don't have, when when in, when you have it, when you're doing eight shows a week and you just get to do the show eight eight times a week and, and you're on Broadway and that's great and that's awesome and then now no one gets to do any theater right now and it's like what like that that's very uh it's got to be it's got to be I mean it's got to be and and uh, and you know this this pandemic is having un having predictable and unpredictable impact, I think, on all of us, right? And and, I, and, and I'm and i curious, um, uh, what about Newfoundland? Is there some art? Uh, what are you doing to, to keep your your, uh, your your toe in the water of, uh, of if that's the right analogy, of, um, of artistic expression and, and music? I warn you, and, if you start doing body parts, it gets weird. It gets, <laughs> my metaphor was horrible. Just stay away, I, Karen, stay away. I'm blaming Astrid if I okay. have the body part reference. <laughs> you know, uh, we've been very, very fortunate here. Um, Newfoundland itself, uh, the province is Newfoundland and Labrador, and there's a mainland portion and an island portion. And the island, being an island, has been able to really isolate itself, uh, which at times has been uh, the bane of our existence, but right now is really uh, working in our favor. Uh, and the whole Atlantic region, which is all of the Atlantic provinces in Canada, um, created a, a bubble that contains all of those provinces. So you're not allowed to come to Newfoundland unless you're a resident or you have uh, an exemption for, you know, special reasons. So uh, the only uh, instances of COVID coming to Newfoundland are literally brought here by someone who has traveled, is coming home from somewhere and has unwittingly brought it with them. Uh, and because of the regulations with uh, quarantining and stuff, it, there's no community spread. We've been very, very fortunate. Uh, and people have been very diligent as well with the mask wearing and the um, uh, distancing and all that sort of stuff. But because we are uh, isolated in the way that we are, um, we've been able to return to some things a little faster. There are, are theaters opening up again now and performances happening. 
uh, and I've been myself in uh, two or three workshops already and heading into another one next week. Um, I've been doing some online teaching at a, a university here on the island. And um, I did this workshop a couple of weeks ago where we actually were in the same room together. And the first time I was actually in a room with other people and we were talking about characters and story arcs and, you know, um, the reasons behind why the actors are, are thinking that a character should do something. And and we all sang together in the same room and I almost wept at the, just the, the beauty of sitting next to, even six feet away <laughs> from someone on either side of me. And we all made music at the same time and sang harmonies and and it was just it was it was like I had rediscovered what music was like I had forgotten what music was because I've done online things and you know you you karaoke yourself to a tune and and make a video and put it out for whoever is asking to have submissions for things and that is great and very satisfying to be a part of something uh, fundraising or uh, raising awareness or whatever and any excuse to sing is always I'm always like yes hello me I'll do it uh, but to actually because there's this is a little bit um, esoteric but the there's a sympathetic resonance in your body when other people sing you literally feel it in your body when other people make that volume of noise at you uh, and to be together with other people and and to be part of that and to be feeling that was just a, a little overwhelming <laughs> oh, I so I, I really wow. look forward to to when I can be closer than six feet <laughs> to the people I'm singing with uh, because there's nothing for me and I grew up as a, a choral singer so uh, ensemble singing is where I am happiest um, and there really is nothing like singing harmonized music all together everyone working towards that one goal that is so achievable uh and is going to bring other people instant joy and satisfaction or pathos of some sort you're either gonna make people laugh or cry or smile or whatever and um i think that's part of what makes uh being a performing artist a compulsion is knowing that you're affecting other people when you do it and feeling that that sensation of doing it. I'm just, I'm just thinking now, Petrina, how much I, Petrina and I are dressing roommates, and I, I'm just realizing how much we sang. We would just sing, and the other girls down the hall would be like, "The Canadians are at it again," because we just <laughs> wanted to constantly make happy noise. Oh God, I miss it. Wow. Yeah, so, yeah, it's like I, watching somebody eat a big sandwich when you're hungry. And it's not jealousy. I'm so happy you have that sandwich. But boy, I just feel like I want to go make a musical sandwich back to back. I, I'm also a, a compulsive harmony singer. Right? Like being yeah. a lifelong alto, I'm like melody schmelody. And as soon as Astrid starts singing, I will harmonize. And uh, I've equated it before with like, it's like surfing over the melody. Uh, yeah. And I, I just really enjoy living in that space. So we do a lot of that in the in the dressing room. And yeah, me too. I miss that a lot. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure you do. You know, it's just got to be so, um, it's got to be so tough, you know, to be sort of cut off from this. But I want to, um, I want to come back to that ensemble theory, because it's so r resonated with me as a Habitat for Humanity thing. You know, it's the sound, except in, in my case, in my mind, all of the, all of the notes and lyrics come out in, but, but when it comes out of my mouth, it all sounds like one note. I can't sing is what <laughs> I'm trying to say. But so I make my music, let's say, you know, by the, the, by picking up a hammer or it's the, you know, the sound and the, and the, uh, the timber of hammers as you're building on a build site or is, is really another kind of music that when, while you were speaking, Katrina, it really brought habitat to mind. Um, I think it's the so collective will of people together moving towards the creation of something which yeah. can only be a, a, a beautiful experience i mean people don't very often come together collectively to create something bad no. <laughs> not intentionally well, they, not well, intentionally well hopefully not i think that's a very you know i i, I don't want to be political but I, i'm starting to do i would start to doubt you now there's it seems like there's a there seems to but, be a, bit of a dark force going on in the in in the universe at the moment but I do Certainly believe. in their own minds, it's not evil. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. But, uh, but, uh, but I, you know, we have to believe that good will prevail and right will prevail and music will prevail and art will prevail. And, and, um, and so and they're building just homes for other people will prevail. 
That is exactly right. What are you up to? And what is my beloved Toronto, um, Astrid, what are you up to in the pandemic? I get news of Toronto uh, a little more frequently than other places in Canada relative to uh, COVID, et cetera. But what is going on for you and what is going on in the art scene in Toronto? Well, it's it's there there is there is stuff happening. There are workshops online and people are still creating creation will out. I mean, um, I just got to hear not too, too long ago, Paul had written a song and he, he sang it for us on a Zoom. I mean, creativity will like people just need to create. I am missing now having listened to Petrina talk about being in the room and the talking about the work and and trying to create stories and getting that ready to bring it to people. And one of our castmates just recently actually got to do something because he was in the Atlantic provinces, uh, an Aerosmith musical, and he actually got to do it for some people. Air supply. Air supply. Air supply. Oh, Lord. Sorry. Air, different, Air supply. completely different. Very bands. different. Very different. <laughs> Those so, would be two very so, different musicals. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, it would be. Okay, they Katrina, would be. let's work on the Aerosmith one. But it, he was doing an Air Supply musical. <laughs> the gospel according to Steven Tyler. Sorry. Exactly. He talked about <laughs> being in the wings and hearing people in the audience, distanced in the audience, but that that hubbub uh, before the audience. And you're talking about sounds of, of, of people being of community and collection and hammers or nails. But for me, like, I can... You can hear that in your mind. I can hear the rustling of like a program and people talking. Is that my seat? And oh, oh, hey, I haven't seen you since we, you know, all that little buzz. And uh, I just hope like that buzz is, is is still there for that we have that for each other that we can break through the social awkwardness when we get back because I know I'm going to just be weirdly awkward with people for a very long time and then just get back to being a community together, doing positive things for each other, telling stories, building houses creating musicals be they Aerosmith or Air Supply like it just you know I can't wait for that so no uh, sorry I kind of got off track but I haven't been able to to tap into to much here except doing like singing to karaoke type tracks for for fundraiser this or that and that is lovely and again I will sing at the drop of a hat oh was that a hat I'll drop drop yeah. a hat I'll sing um or rap even which is really frightening but um yeah I, I'm, I'm hungry it's a great for rapper <laughs> I believe it. I you should see my it. Christmas gifts with the bow. Yeah, yeah. I knew it was oh, coming. I knew it was coming. Yeah. I know you did. I know you could feel it. I had to. I was waiting for that. I was like, she's gonna make a Christmas present joke. It's so. It's. It is so. It is so great. Um, you know, when you mentioned Jen, and I, and I was, of course, I was, you know, reacquainting myself with the musical, and I noticed that she's gone some relentlessly positive, good news optimism track on social media doing some comedy and doing some bringing people together for all uh things positive so it's great that uh the cast me various cast members are finding ways obviously to as you said i think patrina bring up you know find something positive to put back into the world so um well we know one thing for sure when when you're back and we know that broadway will come back because new york and broadway are forever entwined and um, we what we know that we're holding your place uh, on the Broadway Builds Committee. You'll have to come out and wield the paintbrush, um, uh, swing a hammer, um, be part of you know be part of our community here in New York City. Um, a lot of what we do uh, provides housing, but it also focuses on community rooms because many of the affordable housing that people live in in New York City, the community centers are extensions of their living room. So they may live in very small quarters, older, you know, seniors on fixed incomes, et cetera. So we spend a lot of time in community centers that will help people come together in groups. So um, I believe uh, you can't, you can't, um, you know, you can't knock the uh, optimism out of me. I believe that we will be back to that uh, uh, here in New York City and we'll be holding a place for you all um, to come. And uh, you can rap or you can sing or you can... <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you choose to do, uh, uh, as you're as you're working alongside it, um, we're coming to the end of our time. And before we wrap up, I wanted to give you know I want to give each one of you an opportunity to you know any any final thoughts about the experience or about um, maybe a message of hope to to our, uh, the people who are watching our co conversation today. I for me, I think. Um having spent so much time at home now, I think we all have a really renewed uh, understanding of what it means to have a safe 
place to be in uh, because we've been locked down and quarantined and all these things. And and uh, the idea that there are many, many people out there for whom home isn't a safe place just makes me uh, want even more to be a part of the next project that you guys have happening because it's so, so important. And it is one of those things when you have it that you take for granted. And uh, if anything, the pandemic has given us uh, some insight into some of those things and hopefully new perspective. Thank you. Astrid? I don't think I could say it better. I'm, I'm looking forward to being involved with, with Habitat for Humanity when we get back. Um, and definitely this has been a time to remember that it, that home isn't just the building you're in, it's also creating that that community. I'm so used to traveling around and, and having toured a lot and all those things. So having landed in New York, it really became home. And I think it's about where you land and the people you land with. So um, I think trying to make sure we, we keep our peripheral vision open for those who maybe are wandering outside of the community and, and somehow pulling them back in and making them feel safe is, is, is an exciting thought. Thank you. And Paul? Hang in there, everybody. It's going to be <laughs> over at some point. You just got to hang in there. And, uh, and you know, the, the show and it's sort of, you know, the idea that these people showed up on these planes and, and, the, and the towns, Gander and the surrounding communities, they just stepped up because they had to. They every you know you hear you hear people say that say to them that they um, that it's amazing what they did and they were like well we just made some sandwiches you know we just we did what any other human being would do for another fellow human being so I guess just remember that remember your neighbors be nice to your neighbors do nice things for the people that you see every day whether you agree with them or not because right now it's a, it's a strange time to be in yeah. our our country and and have opinions about stuff and uh and let's just remember our our shared humanity so wow that was an amazing big finish and a perfect <laughs> uh, uh ending point thank you for that I, um, thank you to everyone who stayed with us through this conversation Thank you, Petrina Bromley, Astrid Van Meeren, Paul Witte. Uh, thank you to AKA for putting this together. Thank you to our Broadway Builds Committee and for all of the work that, um, that the Broadway community does um, to, to fill our hearts and to fill our souls. We can't wait to have you back in New York. We can't wait to, I can't wait to be in the audience to come for away again. I really, I really mean that. I can't wait to see the show again because I think coming from this experience it will be even that much stronger. So thank you. Um, if, you if, if you're if you so moved, if you've enjoyed the conversation today, maybe you'll consider making a donation on our site. There's a donate link here. Uh, follow us, follow us, follow us on all the social media channels. Um, uh, come out and swing a hammer, make a donation, be part of this, join our conversations. Let's keep this community going. Thank you all. Thank, thank you, you all you, specifically. Thank you, Thank you. Come from away. We'll see you later, eh? <laughs> it's the only yes, time bye. I said it. That was good. <laughs>